I'm going to stick a clip on, watch it, see what you think of it, and if you want to tell me afterwards, we'll get a chance, all right? Sounds good. Jordan Maxwell. Here we go. The earliest Christ Christians, uh, this is from an encyclopedia, not from me. The earliest Christians were referred to by Romans as atheists. They did not believe in God. Why? They were atheists. Why? Is because they did not believe in the Roman gods. And since in Rome, the Romans understood thoroughly that their gods, the many different gods of the ancient Roman Empire, was absolutely, definitively, without a doubt, absolute gods. And if you did not accept the Roman gods as the absolute truth, then you were obviously, in, in, um, in point of fact, an atheist, because you do not believe in Rome's gods. And so today, when somebody makes a statement that I am an atheist, when my whole life I have said over and over again, I have the highest respect for the presence in the universe of what men have called God. But you need to define your terms. When I define God, I mean some sort of an unseen, absolutely profoundly wise and intriguingly simple, powerful presence around us. It kind of overshadows. I like that term. It overshadows our life. It doesn't, it doesn't slap you around, it doesn't make you do things, but it's as if something is watching you all your life, where you're going, what you're doing, and watching what you're catering yourself to, and it is some kind of, an, a, of a spiritual presence that you feel that the universe is, is, is being overseen by some kind of a higher presence. Uh, power, some sort of a higher, and why? Because there were too many uh, things which happened which imply an intelligent uh, stuff going on all around you that you're not aware of. I mean, there's all kinds of experiences people have today in their life. They keep seeing certain numbers. Some people see certain numbers keep coming up. In their life, some people will seem to, uh, to, to have premonitions of the future and they see things which are going to happen. There are people who are psychics who can read your mind. There are all kinds of strange phenomena which we live with every day and people experience every day, which has no uh, explanation whatsoever. And of course, the, the Marxist, Leninist, communist people of America who couldn't care less about God or anything spiritual at all, they say the whole thing is all a bunch of bull and it has nothing to do with anything on the earth. Well, I say no, I beg to differ. There, is too many, there are too many things going on in this earth and in the lives of every person on the earth. And everybody I meet tells me, boy, I had the strange experience when somebody came into my life and did this or that. And I saw this or that, and, and, and I had these uh, strange uh, premonitions. So I know that there's just too much going on with the human family that defies imagination. So I, like all other men who, who care, I have to assume that there is some kind of an overshadowing intelligence watching us. And it gives to each one according to his deed. You do things good for people people will come back and do good things for you. If you go out and hurt other people, other people will come in and hurt you. So it's like a laws in the universe. What goes around comes around. And why is that in everybody's life? Does somebody keep track of every single human? Yes. Somehow or another, there is a continual monitoring of human life on the earth, and everybody gets what's coming to them eventually. So there's too many things that I know and I've seen with my own eyes that tells me. Uh, there's a, a classic example, and let me give you a, uh, an example of what I'm talking about when I say something is overshadowing us. 
listen to what I'm going to tell you. You may have heard this before, but if you haven't, listen closely. It has to do uh, a situation with Abraham Lincoln and John Kennedy. Have you ever heard the connection between Abraham Lincoln and John Kennedy, the president? Uh, yeah, actually, I have because uh, I've spent a okay, lot of time. Okay, well, let me Kennedy, let me yeah. read this. Let me read this to the people who haven't. If you've never heard this, then listen closely. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. John Kennedy was elected to Congress 1946. Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860. John F. Kennedy was elected president 1960. The names Lincoln and Kennedy each contain seven letters. Both presidents were particularly concerned with civil rights. Both wives of both presidents lost children while living in the White House. Both presidents were shot on a Friday. Both presidents were shot in the head. President Lincoln's secretary was named Miss Kennedy. Kennedy's secretary was named Miss Lincoln. Both were assassinated by Southerners. Both were succeeded by Southerners. Both successors to both presidents were both named Johnson. Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln, was born in 1808. Lyndon Johnson, who succeeded Kennedy, was born in 1908. John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Lincoln, was born in 1839. Lee Harvey Oswald, three names, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was said to have committed uh, assassinated Kennedy, was born in 1939, exactly 100 years apart. Both assassins were known by their three names. Both names are comprised of 15 letters. Lincoln was shot at a theater called Ford. Kennedy was shot in a car made by Ford called Lincoln. Uh, both ran for the, both, uh, Booth, John Wilkes Booth ran from a theater and was caught in a warehouse. Oswell ran from a warehouse and was caught in a theater. Both Oswell and Booth were assassinated before they could go to trial. All of these coincidences are not coincidences. This all seems to be telling you a story that things are happening all around you and they're mysterious. Why these dates? Why these connections behind the scenes? So the world is filled with strange things. Like I said, the book, uh, the complete works of Charles Fort give you a whole book full of things which have never been figured out why they happen. So I'm just saying that the world is being overshadowed by something that mankind calls God. But you have no idea what that word means. You have no real idea about what you're talking about. So you need to define your terms and wake up and get and, and train yourself to be intellectually honest. And then you will all, always see how much you don't know, how much you don't understand. And then you will begin to ask questions, and that's what the human brain was designed to do, is wake up, grow up, become adult, and ask questions and begin to train your mind to be intellectually honest and look at the facts and, uh, and look up the facts. Like Steve Allen used to say, there are two kinds of facts, the kind you look up and the kind you make up. Hello? Is everyone there? Hello?
Hello. Oh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Ah, I, I can't uh, hear you. Ah. Uh, um. I might, to, I might have to leave and come back in. Do I need extra volume on the loudspeaker? No, that seems to be okay. I think put the headphones in, maybe that will help. <clears throat> no, I can hear you. I can hear you. Right, can I hear anything now? Nope. Can you hear me, Julian? Hi, can you hear me now? Still can't hear anything. You can't hear me? Yeah, I plug my headphones in. Julian. I've turned my volume up to maximum. Perhaps Julian. if I go to... Julian. Hello, guys. I can hear you both. I don't know why you can't hear each other. I can hear I'm everyone. having a quiet one myself, I, um, I, but I don't mind listening if you lot want to have a chat. I can, um, I can, I can hear both of you. I for the record, as well. I can hear you as well, Julian. I, I don't think you can hear us. Julian, I don't think you can hear us. I still can't hear anything. I hear both of you fine, by the way, Julian. I hear both of you. Um, the host is not here. I don't know what's going on. Julian, are you still here? Get something there for an instant. I can hear something now. You hear me? I think this is not working out, Julian. Hello, Mac. Yeah, I don't know why it didn't work. Sorry, mate. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, I thought you would be able to speak to Pete, but. It didn't. Yeah. It didn't work no out. Right. No, no worries, man. Um, no worries. Leave I don't know if I, if I, if Owen's going to jump on, but not to worry. Give it a couple. Give it a yeah, couple no. of seconds, because Pete might jump back on. I don't know if it's because if I turn my mic off, then you can't hear each other. No, I can hear him. I can hear him, and I can hear yeah. you. I think he. It's a problem he from his side. Yeah, he couldn't hear you either. It's not you. It's me. No, I don't think it's us. I, I think uh, it was him. That's all. That's all. Owen's hovering around in the background. Is he? Is there, like, let's see. All right. See if Pete... One more try with Pete. You have a chat with him if, if it works. I can hear you now. Oh, brilliant. Pete, you're through to Mac. Hi what there. What do you make of Jordan Maxwell? Fantastic. Sounds good. It reminds me of the first insight of the Celestine prophecy from James Redfield about 40 years ago. When you start noticing coincidences, you realise the whole foundation of reality is spirituality. It's not material. Wow. Okay. I mean, yeah, I've always looked, looked up to um, Jordan Maxwell. I think he's taught me a lot, if I'm honest, if I'm listening to him. I mean, were you meant to bring him on um, at one point, Julian? Yeah, yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to, Matt, but sadly passed away before I got the chance. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's taught me a lot. I mean, a lot of the conspiracies I've learned are probably from him. But yeah, so what was your take on what he, he, he was saying just now? What, what, was, what did you find interesting? Can you hear me, Pete? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, well, the weirdness, when you start noticing the weirdness, uh, it's very startling and makes you wonder what's going on. Um, but don't you think it's only, it only seems weird, perhaps, because we only see half the story? It's, this probably gets even weirder. I, I, I'm just saying. I'm not saying it will get any better, but. Yeah, we don't understand. We 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 don't have the apparatus, the the um, awareness to know what's to know the big picture. But we we can just see shadows at the back of a wall, like Plato said. But we can see that it's very weird uh, because we don't understand the big picture. Uh, but we, I think, it, when we when we notice these things, we realise that reality is not material. It's not like a machine. It's far more complex than that, and far more far more than just matter and energy i mean i believe there is a god um there are people i, I was actually having a conversation this recently with someone saying that oh if there was a god why would there be so much um like suffering and so much pain and the only thing i, I, I remember um hearing once was because someone said the same thing about in a similar situation saying that oh i see a lot of messy hairs out there because of the messy hairs, then I feel like there's no um, hairdressers or or hair stylists. But it doesn't it doesn't make that statement to be true. So saying that there is no God because of all the all the mess in the world doesn't make it true. Do you see what I mean? Um, oh yeah. But ultimately, I don't think this. You can't just say that everything came into existence without um, a cause. There has to be something. To, I mean, you can't. You, if I turn around, you know what? Can you think of an example where a bang um, and then something came into existence after it? Like, is there any examples that we can think of in life, in nature, that an, a bang would occur and then something would create out of that bang? Ultimately, I believe that it's not possible every bang that happens has to there has to be a cause behind it and again for for this to be the gold goldilocks and the way we're positioned it's not by coincidence it's i mean you got the likes of einstein saying um if you pursue science you'll c come to the understanding that there is a high intelligence at work governing the laws of physics so it's clear that, that there is something in charge. And, and I, I agree with, with some of the points that he makes, obviously. Um, Jordan Maxwell. But it's true. I mean, what's your take on, on that? Well, uh, coming from a vaguely Christian background, uh, when I saw the Hollywood epics about Jesus, uh, Ben-Hur starring Charlton Heston, The Rope starring Richard Burton, and Quo Vadis starring Robert Taylor, I concluded that that story is so fantastic, nobody could make it up. And although it may have been embellished slightly, the basic historical story of the gospel, I reckon, is absolutely true. But it is so fantastic that it's difficult to comprehend in ordinary mundane material terms. To me, given that it's true, and I don't see any reason why it isn't, because nobody can make it up, uh, it means that this person, Jesus Christ, had powers which are completely beyond anything an ordinary mortal man can imagine. And I would imagine that all the other messengers of God had similar powers, even if they didn't manifest them as clearly as Jesus did. 
Not really. So, Jews, Jews, I mean, ideally, when you look at it from an Islamic point of view, they do mention that Jesus used to bring back dead people back to life. Yeah. Not, no, not many people can, not, not, not other prophets can actually do that. I mean, there will, might have been one instance. I think Moses might have done something similar, but uh, but that wasn't even to bring someone up back permanently. It's just to bring someone back to to uh, mention because I, there was a problem in the in the Israeli community, and Moses had to to sort out a conflict, and he brought someone back to life just to to, to confirm who killed him. But that was about it. Jesus would. I mean, the the kind of miracles Jesus would perform. I mean, the water to wine is nothing. But when we look at he healed the blind. He, he basically a lot of sicknesses and bringing the dead back to life. That is major. That's not normal. That's not. Yeah. That, that that. Do you see what I mean? So yeah, we can't take that away from him. And again, there's another aspect that I mean, most Christians I've noticed aren't aware of this, but Islamically we we say that Jesus started lecturing from. First of all, his I, I, I believe they say that his. Instead of nine months of labor, it took nine hours of labor for Mary to obviously to go through. But as well as that, um, he started lecturing from hours of after being born, apparently. And that's that's that, that was one of the orders that Mary had to fast. And in her fast, I think she had to uh, one of the one of the things was that she couldn't speak. And then Jesus would speak on her behalf as a miracle to prove that he's not just an ordinary baby. He's a he's a miracle as well. Like that was so he, the amount of miracles that Jesus. I mean, from the moment he was born, like he, before he was he he was even born. Instead of the nine months usually labor takes, it took like nine hours or something apparently. So I, 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 that's what I, that's what I do recall that we do say in my religion. So yeah, there, there, I, I, Jesus is regarded highly. Um, I mean, we say Muhammad was the one that bought the Quran. Yes. But Jesus, again, we believe he's still alive ourselves because he was ascended um, as uh, from a Muslim point, whether he was crucified or not, which we we say he's not. But therefore, he's still alive till this day, we believe. Well, physically or spiritually? Both. Both. We, 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 we say he is... We, we even though we say the 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 Mahdi is returning, we say the Mahdi is coming with Jesus. Do you understand? Because there's going to be... Um, the, the first is going to be the Antichrist that's got to show up. Then the Mahdi with Jesus has got to come and address the Antichrist. So, ideally, we believe that Jesus is returning and he's still alive. We, we ultimately, he is. Even though we we say he's a prophet, he is our prophet of our time. Well, Jesus said to Peter, um, "On this rock, in other words, what Peter just said, his declaration of faith, I will build my church." And then later, he said to him the person who was upon whom he was going to build his church, he said, you're going to not deny me three times before the dawn of the next day. So to me, for the church to deny the Christ spirit three times uh, before the dawn of the new age, I think that's a reasonable um, interpretation. It might not be correct or accurate, but it might be plausible. And to me, the three messengers, the three Christ manifestations of the Christ spirit that have thus far not been acknowledged by the church are Muhammad, 622, the Bab, 1844, or the Mahdi, or the Qayyim, and Baha'u'llah, the descent of Ruhullah, the, the uh, spirit the of God, is, Jesus I Christ. I, I, I don't know the, the full ins in and outs of that religion, even though that, that came from, obviously, it started up in, the, in my country, if I'm honest. But um, I because I, what it is, what I can't connect the two is, um, I can't reconcile two facts together, and this is what what I find troubling with with that. I I believe um, it's because uh, first of all they 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 are uniting all religions, but at the same time I'm not saying there's anything wrong with unity, but it just doesn't add up because how how are you going to accept um someone who's worshiping a cow for example? as as like it, as the same like it, it it just religiously i don't i don't see how it works but they're making it work but at the same time i feel if it, it it's like the new world order agenda religion that are uniting do you see what i'm saying they we do have to be aware that they will introduce this type of religion and i believe that that's what it might be because you can't say you're the mahdi when the mahdi was born 
in like 1400 years ago supposedly especially if you're in a region in a, in in a, in a region in Iran their belief of the Mahdi is he was born 1400 years ago not in the late 1800s so whoever was claiming to be the Mahdi it, this information does not reconcile he is in occultation just like Jesus is uh, ascended into heaven do you see what i mean so the Mahdi is in the occultation which I mean, the, the Sunni belief or the, the majority of Muslims, you can say, they don't believe in that. They believe that he will later on appear or he will be born later. But again, that the, certain beliefs, it just doesn't add up. There, there are certain things for me, I feel that just um, contradict it, each other, if I'm, if I'm honest. So I, it, depends I if you, it depends if you mix up the literal and the metaphorical. Uh, for example, the Jews expected Jesus to turf the Romans out of Judea. And because he didn't, they didn't believe him and thought he was a monster, not the Messiah. So it's very easy to take the prophecies literally and therefore True. to think that they haven't been uh, uh, fulfilled by the messenger. So, True. for example, the Chaim is supposed to establish the ascendancy of the will of God over the whole earth. And the Bab didn't do that. He was executed by a firing squad after six years. Yeah. And his faith did not um, encompass the world. It just encompassed 3 million of a population of Persia of 15 million, which is still quite impressive after six years. Uh, but it wasn't the whole world. So for the Bab's sovereignty to be um, applied to the whole world, you would have to say it was a spiritual sovereignty, not a, not a political one. And that would be going against taking all the prophecies and the ha uh, hadith about the Qayyim and the Mahdi uh, literally instead of metaphorically, which a lot of people aren't prepared to do. Like, for example, when Jesus says he's going to be seen riding on the clouds in the visible heaven, the visible sky, in great glory, and every eye shall see him, uh, you can take that literally, but it might not come true because it's not supposed to be taken literally. It might be a metaphor um, for spiritual principles in some way that are very more difficult to understand and the same might be true of the prophecies concerning the kai and the mati so you uh, think are you saying that jesus return is more of um jesus um what was it uh, um uh, awareness no no jesus um what's the, what's the thing well to me all the messengers have two stations the human station and the spiritual station so there was muhammad Ibn Abdullah, the man, and then he was stationed as a manifestation of God, where he was made the vehicle of the revelation of the Quran and everything that came from that. So the two beings in one person, uh, like Muhammad said, this isn't from me, this is from God. I'm just a warner. I'm just telling you what I've been told to say. Jesus said the same thing. He says, don't think these words are from me. They're from my father in heaven. So with all messengers, there's the human um, and there's the divine and the divine overrules the human and the human becomes a, an empty selfless channel through which the divine comes from god so um i, I think it's that, that, well this is bahala's explanation no, but i'm just amazing yeah, yeah bahala explains a lot you know it's like in the Quran, it says uh, um we will uh, is it, uh, we or i i can't remember how god addresses himself but he says, I will tell you of all your disputes. Uh, presumably at the last day, the day of reckoning, the day of judgment. But these day are of... all things that the Prophet Muhammad would say. You know that, right? He's just regurgitating everything that he's learned, I guess. I mean... Well, it's... Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when the spirit, the spirit of truth is coming, he will tell you all things. So is he oh, talking of himself being Christ the spirit of truth? So you believe that Christ won't return. It will be Christ consciousness that everyone will have and... Is that what well, it is? Well, I think when Jesus said, um, you're going to deny me three times, I don't think he was talking about himself as Jesus. I think he was talking about himself as the Christ, the appointed one, the anointed one, the messenger so, of God. So, so Christ, Christ consciousness is what, 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 what will happen rather than his, he will physically appear. Is that what you mean? I think, that's what he, I think that's what he meant, yeah. So, for example, when the lower six did the church service in my boarding school just before I left, they postulated this idea. If Jesus is, had returned now, would we recognize him? Because he might not look like he did 2,000 years ago. 
he might be in a different human identity, even though the Christ spirit might be similar or the same. So I, I reckon the Christ spirit was in Muhammad and the Bab and Baha'u'llah. I don't think we've even got the correct, um, what his appearance looked like correct. You see what I mean? And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. So if, if, a, if, a, a, revel if a revelation from God, if a, a, a messenger from God creates a similar transformation in his followers or in the community, or gives teachings that feel like it's the word of God, albeit slightly different from, from a, for a different age, then if the fruits are good, you know, because Jesus said uh, a fruitful tree gives good fruit, a barren tree does not. And you, you, they don't get mixed up. Mm -hmm. So if a messenger gives good fruit, and I think if we study Islamic history carefully enough and see the tragedy of what happened to Islam after, uh, you know, not long after the life of the prophet, uh, and go back to the origins and see how wonderful that was, and despite the tragic history, the fruits of Islamic history, uh, civilization, which was virtually the foundation of everything Western civilization, through mm -hmm. Cordova and Sicily, and the renaissance and the crusades and so on so how can you deny those good fruits even though they haven't been mentioned in in the western history books very much so yeah. i think to me it's it's would be very difficult to convince me that islam in its origins wasn't from god and when i look at the barbie and the baha'i faiths i feel the same thing after 47 years of experience i see nothing wrong with the religion itself the followers might be not perfect they might have faults, but the religion itself seems okay. But also yeah. there's a possibility that somebody or nefarious forces might be undermining or trying to undermine the Baha'i faith to show it in a bad light or to make the followers uh, behave badly in some way by mind control or something. So I think it's possible to give a religion a bad name deliberately uh, because right. it's, Even because it's not in your interests. You got these suicide bombers that give Islam a bad name when Islam exactly, out. exactly. Think, at the time of the Prophet, yeah, there was no libraries. There, were, if if they would have got rid of the group of Muslims, which was the the group of um, Prophet was around, yeah, they that the, the message of Islam would have been abolished. This is why they did suicide bombing to try and keep to, to, to keep that message safe. But we we don't have that problem this day and age. We have libraries. We have access to the internet. We have this information will not be abolished. So doing this type of act, suicide committings doesn't really make sense nowadays. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, Well, it's it, completely un quranic isn't it? To yeah, behave it like that. Yeah. yeah. At the time, when you for survival of the message of the Quran, it was understandable, but that was a whole different situation. Now, whether I, I do commit this, this horrific act, it, people are still going to be Muslims, whether or not... Do you see what I mean? It's not going to make a difference whether I do this or not. Well, of God was well I, I doubt I doubt that that kind of behavior was even in the time of the Prophet. Um, I doubt it. Well, it, it was like the chemical... I mean, for for battle, when you're going to battle, you know you're giving up your life, right? So that was the... Yeah, but fight. that's not suicide bombing of innocent civilians. No, but it's not that. It's certain certain um, wars where you would know you're outnumbered. You, it's like a suicide mission. You see what I mean? It's not bombing, but it's a suicide mission. Like, it seems that way. So if people would have called it. But again, um, yeah, it's not It's not the same. You're right. I, I would have to agree with you. I would have to completely agree with you on that. I, mean, I don't know enough about Islamic history, but I can't imagine Muhammad actually condoning behavior like that. Um, Agreed. I agree with that. I and jihad, mean, jihad doesn't mean a military conflict anyway. The no. word jihad means a spiritual struggle, like exactly. fighting your own spiritual battles within to improve yeah. your character. So the I'm idea sure of that. taking the word jihad and then applying it to military combat is childish, I think. It might be that. The hadith might suggest that, but I don't believe it's in the Quran. No, you're right. You hit the nail on the head. And I've got a good Islamic teacher, Dr. Taj Hagi. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, no, I'm, you're amazing. Yeah, you you explain that well. Yeah, um, that's that's the, the sum of it. You're right. Absolutely. So I was thinking, um, it's true. The fundamental of all religions now they they talk about peace. It's funny to me that they don't they don't abide by their own religion. Like, look after your own neighbor. It's all the same. But again, oh. when you Look at the sex. I mean, you you got yeah. you got them fighting amongst each other. If anything, yeah. 
Well, if, if, if you think that the Islamic year is, what, 1444? And uh, yeah. uh, AH, something like that. Yeah. And in the Gregorian calendar, the Christian year is 2023. Correct. But when it was 1444, in England, nobody was allowed to read the Bible in their own language. And the only people that were allowed to le read the Bible were the priests who could only read it in Latin. Oh, wow. So uh, when the Bible started to be translated into English and published because of the Gutenberg printing press in Germany, well, 1500s, 1600s, people oh. got burnt at the stake for really? having the gall for having the gall of frontry to read the Bible in their own language. Oh, wow. But, but when they... I mean, eventually they couldn't stop it. So they eventually, it was a 1606 King James II of England, James VI of Scotland. He published the first widely distributed Bible, of it, ha having had it translated quite scholarly into English. And it just went viral. And there were lots and lots of denominations springing up where people were now empowered to discuss and read the Bible in their own language without being priests. You've got the Quakers, the Methodists, the Baptists, all sorts of different groups, um, uh, not under the Catholic hierarchy. Right. So if you, if you imagine if that happened to Islam, so that people in Kurdish or Urdu or whatever, the, the Farsi... The thing is, the you know, reason why that that would never happen in Islam is because of the, the, the one of the miracles is the Quran, right? And the Quran being the Arabic language and being so advanced, and I mean, even they say it's advanced enough that we, we're catching up with it till this day. Yeah. So yeah, but like, even even so, you know, for people to understand their own religion, they need to be able to have it translated into their own language in colloquial style that they can understand to get some gist what the original Arabic means. Otherwise, they're not going to know anything about Islam. You know, just reciting in Arabic without knowing what it means is useless, even if it's an exalted language. No, so you, I think... You'll get, you'll get the, you'll, you should essentially get the interpretation for it, the translation straight away after. And, so, and sometimes if, if they're good enough, the teacher can word for word explain it out to you as you're reading along. Um, well, you, you don't need a teacher. You need to read it in your own mind, in your own language, and make up your own mind what it means and how to interpret it. But, and that, to me, is the application of what happened to the Bible in the 1500s in English and in other languages. So I think when, when and if that happens in Islam, then Islam will experience a blossoming or a, you know, a revival and I think a lot of the interpretations that people will find of what it says in the Quran will be very different from what the mullahs have been saying for the last 1,400 years. Yeah, um, F the mullahs, sorry. I, I'm from a country where the mullahs have ruined the country, like literally. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, same as Ireland. If you go to Ireland, the amount of respect of the church hierarchy is zero now after all the scandals and so on. And they really... The ordinary people, especially young people, they've just turned away from religion completely. They've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And I think in Persia, a lot of people have thrown the baby out, the, out with the bathwater. Because when they've seen what's happened under Ayatollah Khomeini's clerical hierarchy and how they behaved and how they've interpreted the Koran according to their interpretation of spurious hadith, they think, we're not having anything to do with this anymore. So they don't believe in Muhammad and the Koran anymore, a lot of people. And I think that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater because if you study the Quran and the core of Islamic history, the tragedy of what's happened to Islam since you know the death of Ali and Hussein, yep. um, oh, wow. you, can come, you can come to an understanding of the noble religion of Islam irrespective of any nonsense from the priests and have a respect for Islam and a belief in Islam which is bulletproof and no hierarchy of priests priest can destroy that. So for me, you know, I believe in Jesus because of the Hollywood epics, not the church, mm -hmm. because the church never really inspired me for very long. Whereas the Hollywood ethics really got me in the heart and made me feel, yes, this guy to do what he did. He must've had a power from way higher than mortal men. Yeah. Wow. Of course. No, agreed. Yeah. 
I was and, bar- and, and the Bab and Bahala as well. It's happened again. You know, it's happened again. Yeah. I'm only no, only... You mentioned Ali and then Hussein. But, yeah. So you know that this tra- tragic story of Hussein, yeah? I, I believe they were. The, I believe they were the lawful successors of Muhammad. Yeah, as leaders of the Islamic community, and they weren't allowed to exercise their power much. Unfortunately, I think oh. if they had, uh, the whole history of, of mankind would have been much better in the last twelve hundred years. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's coming from an unbiased um, perspective. That's amazing to hear. No, honestly, um, the thing is, I just personally like to look at the history and and learn from because. I, I say history um, don't repeat. It's the fool that tends to or is doomed to repeat it if he doesn't yeah. look back on the history himself. That's that's the way I see it. So for me, I feel it's important that I learn, especially the Islamic history as well. It's good to know. Um, but some people will be like, yeah, that's the Sahabas. Leave them be. That's nothing to do. with. I feel that's a wrong approach to it. Do you see what I mean? Sahabas, yeah. what's that? The Sahabas means that the friends of the prophets. Oh, the companions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 because when you try to debate or discuss these sort of matters, they really don't engage, and they say it's not for us to engage. We don't need, but I feel it is important because we can see what's happened, um, where where it's happened, what's gone wrong, and what all, all of this. I feel it's important because, as, as I said, right now um, there is a division even within different sects. But we need to stop. Like this is what I meant by every religion talks about peace, but they don't abide by it. <laughs> they don't like it's it's really strange and it's like the fundamental core um thing and it's weird but again looking back one of the ma- for me what don't make sense is so talking about religions you know about zoroastrianism as well yeah right yeah so it's, the funny thing is for me when i look at look at that religion I, I have a lot of respect for that religion but islamically they don't they call them fire worshippers which mm. I, I don't understand because to me the fire it has as well as heat and light they it's a symbolic reason why they use the fire is is when they pray they want they want it's like fire sterilizes things right so they want their they want their sins to be sterilized so this is why they it's a symbolic reason why they do yeah. so but i understand that i get that and and it's and the fundamental things are like good thoughts good speech and good action i mean yeah what more, more, more than that would you want yeah that is the basic of all human rights, I believe. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think there's, um, I personally, and I don't know how many Baha'is would agree with me on this, but I feel as though if we look for the positive in every spiritual tradition, uh, the Sikhs of Guru Nanak, trying to bring peace between the Muslims and the Hindus. True, yeah. Uh, the... Um, the Confucianists and the Taoists, oh, yeah. following Confucius and Lao Tzu, yeah. you know, there are lots of moral teachings there. The pagan religions, like the original uh, pantheon of gods of the Romans and the Greeks, yeah. Yeah. way back, those pantheons of gods and the way that their teachings were taught, it had a lot of moral uh, value to it. And the original Roman Roman Republic, before it turned into an empire was quite moral uh, in some ways compared to the other societies. So I think even pagan religions have some kind of moral, like the Druids, you know, there's lots of mystical teachings there which are are of some value. So I think it's possible to look at the positive in every spiritual tradition and see something of value. And Mm -hmm. maybe in the very, very distant far reaches of the past, if it were possible, we might be able to find the original source which was relatively pure and accurate and of course after centuries of oral tradition it becomes diluted and changed. full of elaboration changed yeah uh, unlike, unlike the Quran, where the text is as same as it was in the seventh century that's so that's it. slightly different but uh, all these traditions they get they get uh, corrupted slowly bit by bit um the thing is, the interesting part of the Quran is that there's a part where God actually, he, 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 he talks to every person individually saying, yeah, if you can, he, he goes, if you can make a line or a verse like the Quran, try to. Yeah. Like he, he puts you up to the test. He's like, try it. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 there's a wonderful verse in the Quran, which, and I, I'm not sure of the exact translation because I don't know Arabic, but I've heard that what the correct interpretation is, 
um, the believers, that is the people who believe in Muhammad and the Quran, um, the Jews, the ones who believe in the book, the Torah, the yeah. Christians, the ones who believe in the book, the gospel, the Sabians, whoever they are, yeah. and anybody who believes in God, the last day, and lives righteously is accepted by God and shall fear and shall be not to put to fear or grieve. But the Quran, the Quran says that. Why would you be surprised? Can I ask you something? Why would anyone would be surprised with this? Because if because it, every, every surah we start with, the yeah. in the name of God, the most kind, the most, the yeah. most merciful. How could we call him the most merciful if he's not going to accept those type of people? It's, it's surprising, I think, to a lot of people in the West. And it was a little bit startling to me because I'd seen so much in the mass media about right. mullahs saying, oh, you can, you can um, oh, yeah. abuse yeah. white yeah. girls because they're just white trash. Yeah. You know, kind of racism against Christians or people from a Christian background. I haven't so, seen that much, but I, I assume that's out there. You're, you're right. I guess. Yeah. So I think anything which says, well, our religion, you know, we're the chosen ones and anybody else is going to hell. And the Christians do that as well. The Jews do that as well. I think that's a kind of religious racism, which is not helpful. And I, th I see Muslims doing it occasionally. And I think and I see other Muslims who have delved into the Quran deeply realize the message of the Quran isn't that at all and it's changed them into absolute angels like Muhammad Ali uh Malcolm X absolutely uh Muslims who understand the Muslim message so deeply no nonsense from mullahs in a superficial way saying oh where the Jews and people and these white Christians are devils that's not going to affect them they're going to see the good and give it give credit where it's due and I think that's the true message of Islam for me. But I don't see much evidence of the true message of Islam in the Islamic countries, to be honest. <laughs> you know, what? it's funny you should say that because we, when we left our country and it was supposed to be an Islamic country, there was a saying that we all picked up. We were like, we can't, we Muslims can't be, we can't practice our own Islamic ways, like in certain countries even, like, Basically, you can't be a Muslim in a Muslim country, like a, a, a comfortable Muslim. You have to sometimes, if you're, especially if you're the opposing, if you're in Bahrain and you're, you, do you understand, like it's a Sunni government, but your Shia background is, yeah. it's always conflicting. It's always, yeah. There's a, there's a wonderful story that Dr. Taj Hagi tells of a Muslim, a very eminent and very intelligent Muslim scholar in Al Azhar University in Cairo, and he went for a few months to visit Paris in about 1910 in Edwardian times. And it, what his comment was absolutely priceless. He said, Egypt is full of Muslims, no Islam. Pra mm -hmm. Paris and France is full of Islam and no Muslims. <laughs> incredible, <laughs> incredible. I mean, that's an exaggeration, an over oversimplification. But, yeah. well, you know, comparing the, in 1910 anyway, if not now, but in yeah. 1910, the, prog the progress, the science, the technology, the progressive ideas, the democracy, the, the idealism of Paris and France compared to a slightly more decadent, conservative, reactionary, you know, backward Islamic country in Egypt, say. To him, that as Al Azhar scholar, it was obvious what the situation was. And, I, and historically, I would say, well, the torture civilization it was passed from Islam during the Renaissance to Europe. Europe then had the torch of civilization and Islam, where it had been the golden age of Islam in the Baghdad Caliphate of the Abbasids, that was yep. completely trashed by the Mongols in the in 1200s. Yep. So after the 1200s, there was no Islamic civilization and the torch of civilization being passed to Europe through the Renaissance. That's my understanding anyway. Yeah, no, you, you, you again, hitting the nail on the head all the time bro you've done your do, 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 I've, I've had a lot of I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants other giants have done all the work all the spade work and I'm just I've just listened to them and you know absorb their insights you know no, you, so. you're even teaching me a couple of things here and there I'm not gonna lie bro honestly mashallah mashallah you, you are a very knowledgeable person as well so I'm, I'm, I'm very I'm very inquisitive I like to know 
No, it's good. Knowledge is yeah. power. Uh, knowledge, knowledge is beautiful. Uh, you know, Baha'u'llah yeah. says knowledge is wings to, for, I can't remember exact words, wings for man's ascent, uh, like going up a ladder into heaven. It gives cheer and exaltation and gladness and joy. And I feel that. I feel, you know, to know things and to learn is just wonderful joy. Because, for example, the history of religion, when you see the intricacies and the twists and turns and the development, and you wonder, what's God doing? You know, but you can see the general thrust of history through the different stages of civilization. Yeah. And uh, it's just, it's just... Uh, it's more than fascinating it's it's wondrous i think there was is it Baha'u'llah like quoting ali in the seven valleys where he says increase my amazement at the O lord you know so yeah. i think god's knowledge and god's creation and the way he organizes things is just uh, it's mean, more than fascinating it's intoxicatingly beautiful sometimes um, on the show, I can't remember what it was. There was there was a funny um, line that the guy said really cracked me up. He goes, "If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans." Oh yeah, Mor Morgan Freeman laughing at Bruce uh, Almighty, uh, Jim Carrey. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that was a great line. I thought, wow. yeah, lovely film. Yeah, God, God sees things we don't, so we tell him our yeah. plans, and he's laughing. You think, is that what you want? Yeah. <laughs> And also, also, when you think about it, human sensibilities and human instincts, you know, the things that make us feel grief and joy. And God, it seems to me, with a much wider perspective, he thinks, what? You know, what are you worried about that for? It's nothing, you know. <laughs> exactly. but, it's, but it's difficult for us because we see everything from our human perspective. Well, and we value creatures, certain things. We, we value... Myopic. We are sorry? very myopic creatures. We're well, but we, we're limited in our perception. You know, we're just we're just seven foot. No, it's not. We're just six foot high, bipedal mammalian <laughs> uh, primates. D you know, partly descended from gorillas, and partly with DNA from God knows where out there. And mm -hmm. that's all we are. We're just like ants on the surface of this little mote of dust in a sunbeam. And compared to God, who created the whole multiverse, you know, we're not very much at all. Uh, there's a wonderful line from a Baha'i comedian, an uh, actor called Rain Wilson. Uh, oh, and in his acknowledgments to his book, The Bassoon King, he says, in his acknowledgments, he says, thank you to all the stars at night for constantly reminding me how small and significant I am. I thought, brilliant. It just made me laugh out loud because people <laughs> normally say small and insignificant. Right, but right. We, but you know, no matter how small we are as little ants, yeah. We are significant because we potentially have this connection with the Creator, which makes us divine. A tiny little bit of divinity, a tiny little bit, yeah. I... Just a spark, yeah. I mean, in religion, it does most cases say we have the same attributes as God. We too can yeah. be creators. We too can love. We too can. Yeah. Still... But we have limitations. We mustn't get too big for our boots. Otherwise, no, no, God's going to zap yeah, us with a burning meteor. Yeah. No, you're, you're right. But we, we are made speaking. in his, kind of made in his reflection, not literally. Yeah, literally. yeah our soul, our soul, our spirit. Oh, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah. Exactly, precisely. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. But yeah, that's amazing. Mac, Pete, I'm going to wrap the show. It was a Brilliant. better show without me. Much appreciated, <laughs> gentlemen. Well done. Really oh, appreciate yeah. it. Um, thanks for tuning in. Anyone that did, we'll do it again next Monday. Nice one, gentlemen. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you.